Hey, this is Elwyn Robinson, founder of Feel Younger Genetic Insights and the Rejuvenate podcast. And I'm delighted today to be joined again by Dr. Miriam Mikitsky, uh, shortened to Dr. Miriam usually, who is the uh, uh, a UK trained GP, uh, which is the same as MD over in America. Um, she has clinical experience in the US, China, Japan, and Poland. And she is uh, one of the first members of the Institute for Functional Medicine in the UK. And she's been a functional medicine doctor for a long time as well. Welcome, Dr. Miriam, to the Rejuvenate podcast. Thank you for having me, Elwyn. And it's great to be back here. So um, previous episodes we've done are kind of ones that I really wanted to pick your brains about. We talked about different test results. And I wanted an episode about female hormone optimization because I'm not an expert. So I recommend people check all those out. Um, but when I asked you what would you actually like to talk about, you said you'd like to talk about skin health. And uh, tell us why this is something that you wanted to discuss today. Well, to be honest, I most functional medicine doctors specialize in one particular area they use kind of the same framework where we know we look at gut health adrenals and we're going to get into all of that but um, usually just to stay up to date with the you know the latest research it's always good to pick like a specialty area and over the years because i've seen um so many patients with autoimmune disease uh, skin conditions often come into that and so i've i have developed a bit of a special interest in skin because of that um and also from the anti-aging point of view, I've just found it a really fascinating area because, um, you know, even if you look at longevity podcasts and these like longevity projects, people actually can reverse aging in their skin very quickly compared to other organs. So, and you know, I think then people feel better about themselves, really helps with with um, mood and well-being. So I've just found it, it's a very interesting area to integrate um, holistically into a functional medicine practice. And um, and yeah, so that's how I got into it and why I thought it would be an interesting thing to talk about. Yeah, definitely. And I know, you know, I call my brand Feel Younger because I do think how you feel is more important than how you look. But of course, how you look affects how you feel. It affects how people treat you. Even as myself, as an anti-aging person, I know if, I, if my face looked really wrinkled, a lot of people would take me less seriously. Um, so, you know, it, it is very important. Um, so... Uh, I know that you're quite familiar, well, very familiar with Chinese medicine as well. Um, there's something I heard in Chinese medicine, you can tell me if you agree or if you think it's wrong, um, that if you have skin issues, it's actually a sign of relatively high health or vitality because it means that your body is kind of um, only suffering on the most external level rather than a deeper level, like the, the heart or the kidneys or something like that. So I've often told people that, not as a authoritative thing, but just as an anecdotal thing to kind of cheer them up if they're skin issues. I was like, look, it could be worse. I mean, it shows a relative strength in your system, maybe. Uh, what's your take on that take? Well, it's interesting because I um, so I'm, I'm actually doing a, a TCM dermatology training at the moment. and. Uh, in TCM, they do divide skin issues into kind of three layers into how you're how you're actually treating the skin disorder. Um, so I agree, most cases of acne, psoriasis, um, initially you you do start by treating that external layer, and you're hoping that the condition hasn't gotten bad enough that it's affected the the deeper layers. But in in quite severe cases of of really any skin issue uh, and a problematic skin issue it does actually involve the organs and often kind of that second. So that first layer where you're just trying to treat the external and like drain heat um, is, is that first step. And in most cases, actually, I would say people's conditions improve and they sometimes don't need to go much further than that. But um, but then I would say in, you know, if you take it a step further, we then really do need to look at the health of the tsang fu and the other organs and and really try and work on that in a deeper layer. So I, I agree with you, but then I think in some cases, particularly for example, like serious cases of psoriasis, you have to you have to actually it is a manifestation of what's going on way deep in you know under the surface. Yeah, okay. All right. So it really depends. That that makes sense. Um, all right, so before we get into psoriasis and acne and all that kind of um, dysfunction of the skin, let's just talk about like the, the most basic element of the skin, like aging. 
like what causes the skin to age because i think that's universally every single person watching and listening is going to care about that um so let's go through the different factors that cause it to age and the different things that we can do to help it to not age to to be as useful as possible yeah so so you know so we know that um skin aging is is unfortunately a natural process just as aging is a natural process but we know that there are external and internal factors that can influence how quickly that happens um and you know now as as kind of medicine has advanced there are ways that you can reverse aging in the skin through you know, things like lasers microneedling kind of more i'd say more advanced topics but if we take if we look at it on a more basic level um i think that um you know the way that you were actually talking about aging in your genetic blueprints uh, actually can really pertain to that so the first one being genetics we know that there are um you know we know that actually if you look at how your parents aged that is without any additional support how we would expect you to age more or less um you know and so uh, there are definitely genetic snips that relate to collagen production and um and sebum production um, and you know other factors that can really affect how you um how you age and you know i know in your in your reports you do have that um those snips that are collated um i think for acne for skin aging um skin wrinkles you know, i know that's a popular one um and and you know i think there we do look at some genes that relate to to collagen synthesis, to keratin synthesis. And so uh, I think that's a very important factor that um, you don't want to, um, that, you know, it's good to take a look at. And, you know, ideally, if you're thinking about this when you're younger and you know that you have those SNPs, you're then more, more likely to change the other exogenous factors that you have a bit more control in. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so genetic factors, yeah, it's always good to look at those and start with those if you can, as we talked about. Yeah, I'm just looking at skin elasticity, skin hydration. There's a lot of factors that we have genetic reports about. So these are all things that, as you say, genetics make a difference. And honestly, that is the. I was interviewed recently by a woman in her late 60s, I think, who uh, you know had pretty much perfect skin, and I asked her what she thought it was down to, and uh, she said, yeah, genetics. That was like her first answer. Like both her parents had great quality skin. So that's the truth of everything, right? Like um, what we've been handed down by our parents is a significant factor, and it's good to clarify that. Um, okay, so next on my list usually that I would look at would be nutrients. So uh, are certain nutrient deficiencies, uh, can they contribute to uh, rapid or accelerated skin aging? Definitely. I, I would say that I pretty much check everybody who has any sort of skin issue or, I mean, I would say just extend it systemically to any inflammatory issue. I like to get a fatty acid profile. So I like to look at their levels of uh, omega-6 to omega-3. Uh, and I think, you know, we know that omega-3s are uh, very important for skin health, um, particularly um, EPA. Um, EPA and DHEA, but I think there's more there's more sort of research to support EPA's role. Um, then also when we look at omega six, I think most people think omega six as being a, a sort of a bad fatty acid, but if we break down those omega sixes, um, uh, we have gamma linoleic acid, so that's present in things like borage oil and um, evening primrose oil, and that also um, contributes to skin health and hydration and is one that I also like to add in if uh, if people are depleted in that. Um, so fatty acids, then I think just looking at other fat soluble vitamins, so uh, vitamins A and E um, and D, um, happy to expand on those, but I generally like to make sure that people have a good amount of all of those through food and through supplementation if needed. Yeah, E is especially one that I think of with skin health. Uh, that seems to be the main thing that there is good evidence that it does help with. Um, is that because it's an antioxidant protecting the skin from free radicals or is it more complicated than that? Pretty much. It's essentially protecting against uh, fat oxidation and uh, you know, and so thereby sort of contributing to kind of a healthy healthy skin barrier. And I actually, I mean, I use quite high doses of vitamin E because there's there are other um, uh, other benefits of vitamin E. Uh, for example, if you have high pyrroles, which is an oxidative stress marker, that's one of the best ways to actually decrease it. Uh, but you're looking at sort of a dose of around four to eight hundred IU's per day of vitamin E, and ideally in the kind of mixed to form is the, is the best form. Um, 
How, how would that compare to tocotrienols? I know some people prefer those. Do you, do you see any benefit in those? Or I've used tocotrienols. I haven't really noticed too much of a of a difference, and so I've I've normally just stuck to mixed tocotrienols and or I mean even actually including things like um, cod liver oil and uh, and and foods that are rich in vitamin E. Um, but I, um, yeah, I mean by and large, I think. It, yeah, I think also it's a bit of a, a naming thing. My my sort of um understanding of tocotrienols is that you have sort of yeah the alpha, beta, gamma, delta ones, and uh, whereas you know compared to to mixed tocotrienols, it's um yeah it's there's not really I would say too much of a difference there. Okay, so, it's so funny you haven't you yeah. haven't mentioned nutrients I would think of, which is interesting, and obviously you know more about it than me, but uh, I would think of biotin. Um, I think a lot of people buy uh, biotin supplements, especially for skin, hair, and nails, even though, of course, it's useful for energy metabolism and all kinds of stuff. Is that something that you ever use? Yes, so, so I guess we I didn't quite finish the list there. I mean, to be honest, I think of biotin more for... Um, for hair health uh, and so I do use that and um, hair loss is a, another thing I tend to see a lot of in my practice and so uh, uh, I do recommend uh, biotin particularly for you know, um, hair that's kind of breaking off but generally I tend to see that with dry skin as well and we know that uh, biotin is also crucial for methylation and methylation processes are also involved in um, in kind of um, building and breaking of of skin, the regeneration process. So yes, by all means, biotin is a good one to have as well. What I what I often find though is uh, when we actually check biotin levels in people who have been taking biotin, they shoot up quite uh, quite dramatically. And so I normally just give people quite an intense dose of biotin for a period of time, and then stop stop it, and not, and I won't have them use it for the remainder of the year, and then sort of you know just to kind of use it when they when they notice that they they think their hair is in a bit of a weaker state but i tend not to use it long long term so even though it's water soluble from your in your clinical experience it is quite stored by the body like it accumulates that's what i've seen um and um and you know when i say people have been taking it for a long time it's been like a year or two that they've been on it so not you know not like 10 years but still uh a long enough period of time where i'm like oh wow that's actually you know, it's like a hundred times the limit. So we probably should pause it and, and, and see, and not everyone checks their biotin levels. So just from the cases I've seen where we have checked them, it's made me a bit wary to sort of use biotin for longer than a period of a couple of months. Um, but then often we'll, you know, if, if then hair quality improves the next year, we might try it again for a month or two, especially if the levels have come back down. I, I took high dose biotin uh, because I think my Nutrival said that I had a quite elevated need for it. And I realized it took me a long time to see this connection because I hadn't thought of it. But it, every time I take it and it's like 10 milligrams or something, uh, it makes my skin itchy. And I was like, eh, I'm just going to stop taking this. <laughs> um, it, I don't know why that would be the case. Maybe you don't either. You know, I know it, it's idiosyncratic why uh, people get kind of different side effects. but. It's interesting because I would, if I'm thinking about it from, I know it helps the methylation process, but methylation is also supposed to help with histamine breakdown. So maybe it's some, maybe you're, you were somehow breaking down more histamine and that was causing some sort of a reaction, but it almost seems like the, the opposite would happen. So yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe it was something like an additive added in or. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. A capsule or something. Cause I've not heard that. Okay, so I didn't let you continue. Sorry, yeah. What other nutrients uh, would you like to focus on for skin? Uh, sorry, actually, before I let you continue, you said methylation. So is all the other typical methylation nutrients ones you would use, like uh, B, uh, B6 and B12 and folate and all that kind of stuff? Not necessarily for kind of every skin patient. I would say I started with the omega-3s and the GLA because I tend to use that, I would say, in a majority of my patients with skin issues and skin aging. Um, but uh, you know, I think that's where you have to take the wider context in. And somebody who may have low mood and is under methylated, um, we have when we have worked on methylation and supplied those nutrients such as B12, SAMe, 
um, often we do see a um, an improvement in skin, but I wouldn't sort of do that for everybody. Um, but actually, SAMe, um, acetonasal methionine, uh, that's also a um, an important methyl factor that's involved in the health of your cartilage and uh, and joints and fibr fibrinous tissues. So that would also be one that I would use for skin health if somebody was under methylated, and I've seen skin improve just by using just by using that. Um, that maybe wasn't the main goal, but for example, people would say my mood improved, but oh, I noticed also my skin looked a lot better. Mm, interesting. And that is one that people have to be careful, not just use willy nilly, right? Um, I know it can have side effects. And I think in some countries it's medic, uh, is it prescription only, Sammy? I think. In, in some countries it is, yes. And it's something that yeah, you don't just want to go out and buy and start on like you know, on, on a high dose of SAMI because that you have to also look into homocysteine and other breakdown factors. So it's a quite complicated process, but it is one that actually do find helps the skin. Um, one that I should actually go back to, um, vitamin D. Uh, it's an interesting one because, you know, with exogenous factors affecting the skin, I mean, we know that sunlight, um, as good as it is for vitamin D, it does age the skin. And we know that, you know, aging is a natural process. And, you know, I think in terms of looking younger, it's always this conundrum that people face that, you know, we want to absorb vitamin D from the sun, but then we don't want it to age our skin. And, you know, from a, I would say more aesthetic skin point of view, you know, my, my viewpoint has always been, um, you know, really most people should be taking vitamin D. And ideally getting sun exposure, but not on the face or hands or areas where aging kind of just um, is most prominent. So uh, I think that is one where I'm, I kind of side more with, I would say, the conventional dermatologist that actually on, on the face, we really want to be avoiding sun exposure um, to prevent, you know, to prevent wrinkles. And, and, and that's one where I think people just also haven't had the right, the right education because you know, everyone's like, okay, wear a sunscreen, but I think there need to be quite um, a more stricter sort of requirements of how to avoid the sun uh, to avoid facial aging. Yeah, I think, you know, I know a lot of people in my kind of world would say the sun is only damaging if, right, like if you have uh, excess free radicals or if you have too much um, uh, seed oil, you know, built up underneath the surface of the skin, the adipose layer, all this kind of thing. But I have to say, again, you know, experientially, it is people who are very pale and who have been very pale all their life who seems to have the best quality skin, like the least damaged skin. So that does indicate to me that the sun is damaging the skin or aging the skin, let's just say, uh, in the majority of cases. So, yeah, I kind of agree with you anecdotally um, about that. And I, I use a vitamin D lamp rather than a supplement these days. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll apply it to the center of my body. I'm not trying to get my hands or face or anything because the idea is your center of your body doesn't get much sun usually. So it's then it's not excessive. That's the idea. Exactly. No, I, I agree with you there. And I think, you know, the, your point about um, antioxidants by all means, and I think they, they've actually even done studies with certain antioxidants like um, pycnogenol from the pine um, pine bark that, uh, for example, uh, people who, who take that regularly had much lower incidences of melanoma and other skin cancers. And despite getting sun exposure, like these studies were done, I think in South Africa and areas where they do get um, a lot of, of sun exposure. Uh, so, you know, in a way, they're the antioxidants are preventing the sun damage, but the but the the sun damage is still gonna is still gonna occur. And um, you know, I think I think also from an aesthetic point of view, a lot of women are trying to avoid hyperpigmentation and spots, and those aren't necessarily things that are negative for your health. But from a you know a, an aesthetic skin point of view, they want to avoid. So I would say really you need to be careful about just getting avoiding that direct sun exposure on your face but then getting your vitamin d through through other mechanisms because we don't we definitely don't want to see low levels you know low levels of vitamin d are linked to pretty much any skin condition psoriasis um eczema they they've shown a direct correlation with that mm. I saw a map recently of the US of incidents of melanoma mapped onto the different states of the US and uh, the more northerly you got, actually, the higher the incidence of melanoma and the, the, the southern states all had a lower incidence. 
and then it was juxtaposed against a map of uh, blue light exposure and the more blue light exposure which again was higher in the north like it, it there was almost an exact i don't know it can be correlation or causation but there was almost an exact mapping of the more blue light exposure the more incidence of melanoma so some people talk about how Again, it's not the sun per se, but it is that the blue light exposure dysregulates our ability to um, handle the rays of the sun effectively. Now, that doesn't really invalidate your point because we're all so exposed to blue light these days that what you said is still true, <laughs> that the sun would then still cause an issue. But I'm just wondering if you've heard of that theory and uh, what you think of it. I have, and I mean, I do think that um, we know about how damaging uh blue light excessive blue light can be for the mitochondria and that's going to contribute to inflammation and and aging and, and so i think it you know it makes sense to limit your exposure as much as you can i i mean with those those studies linking kind of skin cancer to those northern climates i do think that there's um you know we look at the the rates of melanoma being linked to the amount of severe sunburns um and i think um you know, again, genetics, if you're someone who, um, you know, has been gradually exposed to to sun or has lived in a sunny climate, um, your body's going to have those defense mechanisms and actually might be, it might be able to kind of handle that skin, that sun damage a bit better. I think what happens a lot of times with Northern Europeans is that they, they avoid the sun or they don't get as much exposure and then they get a lot of it, they get a severe sunburn and they have a lot of free radical creation from that and then they're more um you know they're more susceptible to to melanoma um, i'm very uh what's the word asperger's about it like when the sun starts coming out i literally i go out and i do one minute on each side and then a couple of days later or a day later i'll do a minute and a half on each side as <laughs> i very gradually build it up but i realize not as many people are as uh what's the word um hyper controlling or whatever is that and yeah as you say when it's sunny they just go out and lie in the park or on the beach for uh, all day and, and then get burned so so that's a good recommendation then right gradually increase your uh, exposure over time gradually increase your exposure and then i would say you know particularly areas that don't get a lot of sun um you know have you know expose those and uh, and that way you can get a little bit of that natural vitamin d production but actually making sure you're getting enough antioxidants in the diet um, and through supplementation is also very important. Okay, great. Uh, so nutrients, another nutrient I think of skin aging I hear a lot is collagen. What's your opinion on collagen? And and I guess vit vitamin C and stuff that is related. That, that help promote its production. Yeah, so co collagen's, um, you know, very important for skin elasticity. Um, and I do, I do recommend that people are getting enough of those amino acids that are necessary for collagen production. Um, in terms of like actually supplementing collagen, I haven't, I mean, I, I take it, but I don't actually, I haven't had somebody who's directly told me that, oh, I started to take collagen and I noticed a big difference in my skin elasticity. So I think it's one of those that I think it's about making sure your body can synthesize collagen on its own, um, you know, which, uh, you know, so kind of more of the amino acids like lysine and leucine, proline, arginine, um, making sure that you just get a good variety of them. Um, yeah, but I wouldn't say collagen would be kind of the number one thing I would recommend um, to take orally. Uh, I just think that there's still bit of mixed evidence if it's actually going to directly improve your um your skin elasticity i think the other thing is of course if your digestion isn't great then are you really going to absorb that collagen i think is the other issue yeah fair enough i mean honestly again anecdotally the benefits i've heard for collagen are more people feel more relaxed probably because of the glycine and the proline and then people saying it helps their gut health um but you know, some people do claim that it's helped their skin. I guess you know it's uh, it's hard to say without, as you say, more uh, more evidence accumulating. Um, okay, any other nutrients that you like to uh, focus on? A vi vitamin C. You actually you you pointed that out. That that is very important for collagen production, and um, it's one that's also a very important antioxidant for skin health. Um, I like to. I mean, I like to try and get people to to actually have um, 
good food sources of vitamin C or even like food derived vitamin C. So either from like rose hip or camu camu. Um, I, a lot of my patients can't really tolerate ascorbic acid or they find it quite irritating to their stomach. So I'm, I don't use a lot of that form of vitamin C in my practice, but, um, you know, liposomal vitamin C and then the food derived vitamin C, I, I do, um, recommend for skin health for really the same mechanism for its antioxidant properties. And then for the, the collagen th synthesis. Nice. Uh, yeah, one thing skin health related, I noticed when I was really ill a few years ago, um, my eyelids just started to droop. Um, like, and I hadn't had that before. And it's still the case. They haven't gone back. Uh, it's not bad enough that it's, you know, gets in the way or anything. But like, what cause is something like that? Is that a collagen issue? Is that something else? Do you have any idea about that? I know a lot of people do surgery. I've never had cosmetic surgery and I very much doubt I ever will. So that's not really an option. And even if I can't fix it, I was just curious what made happen in the first place, like how it just suddenly would droop in the course of a few weeks. You can. It's an interesting question. I, you And I'm just trying to think like outside of the box of anything else that could have contributed. But often if you have um, any kind of paralysis of the nerves um, in the face, um, you know, for example, like in people who get um, who get uh, Botox, uh, you they will get actually eyelid drooping because of the relaxation of the, the forehead and I wonder if maybe there could have been you know virus uh, uh, maybe in the nerves that caused some sort of like muscle paralysis and that's caused the drooping um it certainly also could be from um from collagen but then we would expect that you would have muscle wasting or you know it wouldn't just happen isolated on that area of the face mm. um you yeah, know so if weird. you do think that it was yeah um my guess would it be it would be something maybe viral related, like an attack on that nerve, and maybe actually you'd be, you know, you you know taking things or adding in nutrients, for example, like phosphatidylcholine. It's another one I sh should mention. Um, and things that are good for nerve health could also could also help with with the overall skin. So phosphatidylcholine is something you'd also use for skin health. Yeah, you know, it's you know it's interesting because it's hard. I think there's so many nutrients that contribute, and I think we can expand on this that there are also other conditions that can cause skin that can present with skin issues like dry skin and thyroid. So I I normally have to think of it as a condition, but and or you know the area, and then correlate it to the skin health. But certainly, phosphatidylcholine and and choline um is very important for cell membranes and um is also um yeah important for kind of that fatty layer of of the cell membrane and also contributes to good skin health well we could go to uh hormones next but let's do a quick pit stop first with toxins is there any particular uh you know toxic exposure that uh accelerates the aging of the skin that you think is worth uh, mentioning that people need to check or deal with i'd say toxins across the board um are going to um, uh, you know, really uh, affect your detoxification organs and put a lot of stress on them. And when your liver and kidney aren't really working properly, that's often where you get a lot of excess hyperpigmentation, aging, uh, skin issues. Um, you know, so uh, in terms of like s specific toxins, um, they're all equally bad. I mean, I just generally recommend. Doing, <laughs> so it's more toxic load, just the just amount more of toxic toxins. Load. Exactly. And, but, you know, looking at things like uh, glyphosates and microplastics and, um, you know, uh, benzene and sort of petroleum based exposures as well. I think that it's, it's, um, it's good to just have an idea of what kind of toxins your skin is being exposed to. And it's really then your body trying to eliminate those or struggling to eliminate those that can then manifest with skin issues. I know you regularly test for detoxification markers, and we talked about that in the uh, the episode where we talked about the liver. Do you see a correlation between um, liver not being optimal and rapid accelerated aging of the skin? Or if it's not that, is it something else? Like, is there any common... We'll talk about hormones other than hormones, which we'll get into in a second. Is there any other kind of common test markers that you notice correlate with uh, rapid aging of the skin? I mean, I definitely see 
high GGT, uh, which we know is a, a marker for um, toxicity and that the bile ducts are really struggling to get rid of, of toxin. Um, I, you often, though, I mean, I often also see people with um, who have um, have drank excessively, drank excessive alcohol, having high GGT, and that that I definitely think correlates with uh, with aging skin. Um, whether that could also be because they're then not getting enough nutrients in addition to the alcohol is 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 could be a confounding issue, but certainly that's one marker that I would I would look at. Um, I also, I would say this, um, looking at overall blood tests and markers, um, um, even things like being anemic and having, um, you know, low hemoglobin uh, and then not having enough oxygenation to, to any of the organs that, that has an effect on aging of your skin. So I should probably point out that yeah, those who are struggling with anemia or low ferritin, um, I've seen a correlation there with, um, with, uh, aging skin. That definitely makes sense. And just before we leave toxins, I was thinking rather than individual toxins, like how about just uh, like smoking, I was thinking of. That's an obvious one, right, that accelerates the aging of the skin. I have a theory, you can tell me if you agree or not, but I, when I see cultures where women use very large amounts of makeup from a very young age, I often find that they have really poor skin health, like often their face looks very ravaged by the age of 30, whereas in cultures where that's not the case, it seems to be not the case. Um, so I have a theory that the amount of toxins in makeup, especially if they're you know worn all day every day, uh, are accelerating the aging of the skin. So are there any other? Do you agree with that? And other other things like that that I might not have thought of, like things that people commonly do that are actually significantly accelerating aging that are toxic. Um, definitely, I would say um, smoking and vaping, which has now kind of become the the healthier version of smoking. I, I just, I don't think that's the case. I think that's going to also still correlate with, with aging skin. Um, makeup, I agree. I think now there's a, a, a big push from the, uh, you know, from the beauty industry that there is, that there are, um, uh, you know, databases of sort of makeup that use less, less chemicals. Um, in the U S it's the skin deep, um, site on the environmental working group. And I, you know, I think, um, you know, definitely, I think that there is uh, there is a correlation there, and and uh, I think also not just um, uh, you know not just makeup, but in general, beauty products, um, hair products, some of the skincare products, um, a lot of them actually are um, some of those chemicals that are used. They get rid of oil on the face, but they're just very harsh, and that that also contributes to to aging. And and I think just um, you know, I think also with skin, it's um, your kind of your daily routines with it are very important so you know the way that you are you know some people look at how they condition their body and their exercise regimen I think you have to think of skin in a similar way so making sure that you're using sort of gentle things to get that excess skin layer off and those dead skin cells um and using kind of non non-toxic um uh you know materials to, to to clean the skin but then also adding in some of that that moisture and trying to protect that skin barrier. I think that art is kind of being lost and people are wanting more kind of quick fixes and and procedures that can that can lead to it. And I think you can actually get worse outcomes. And I mean, we can go into this, but when we talk about more like aesthetic procedures and things that women, women and men are doing to to improve their skin health, it just has a much better effect if you're actually somebody who has consistently cared for their skin, both in and out. So not only just with nutrients, but also making sure that you're using non-toxic um, products regularly on the skin. Genetic Insights provides cutting edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. 
Using their system is quick and easy and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, You'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. I have to say, just to be honest, my skepticism, and you can tell me if I'm ignorant or wrong, um, but when I see people do all this kind of stuff with their skin in their face, like, as I said, mine is okay, given all the health challenges I've had for someone in their mid forties. I've never done anything for my skin ever. Like the only thing I've ever uh, done is uh, like put oil on it. Like sometimes coconut oil or something like that. Like it just seems to me in a way that the more you're messing around with it, the worse it gets, the more you're using all these different products. And again, I may be ignorant because maybe there are good products that actually make it better, but it just seems like a lot of the time, maybe most of the time, all the messing around people are doing is not actually helping and that people who don't do any of that are actually better off. What would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I think if you're putting on putting, let's say, makeup on the skin, you have to have a good regimen of taking that off. Uh, yes, okay, so that's... Build up that, dead skin. <laughs> that makes sense. If um, you're doing makeup, then you've got to have a regimen. You're right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, fair uh, enough. But then likewise, I would say if you're, let's say, putting on sunscreen, even a, you know, a zinc oxide or um, non-toxic based one, you also need to be removing that. Otherwise, you get dead skin cells that can then lead to, um, you know, the pores being clogged, bacteria proliferating, and then more acne. But I think, you know, to your point, I I, I do think that people mess around too much with the skin. And, um, you know, but I, maybe in your case, it's just that you haven't really put much on there and you're eating a high yeah, antioxidant diet, taking the right things. So, so actually your cell turnover is, 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 is actually working quite well. Um, but I think from, from your, yeah, from your point about, you know, women and makeup, I think part of the problem is this women are using too much from a young age that's affecting probably the health of their detoxification organs but it's also leading to uh, if it's not being cleaned off properly it's leading to a lot of a lot of issues with uh you know uh, gut skin microbiome and and clogged cell uh, pores and, and and dead skin cells that makes sense so yeah i think i was speaking a bit from male privilege there of not having to wear makeup but yeah i understand if you you do have to for cultural reasons or whatever then what you're saying makes a lot of sense you got to remove it properly and, and all the rest of it yeah thank you for clarifying that um okay uh, any other common toxins that um like when it comes to skin i i would think of like what people wear being quite important uh so both the materials that they're wearing uh like for instance you know if it's polyester their skin can't breathe and then also like the if they're washing their clothes in highly toxic stuff then like if i if i wear clothing that has been washed in some kind of normal brands laundry detergent or whatever my skin will be irritated i'm amazed that everyone does it all the time um uh, like is that just me being hypersensitive or is that stuff actually bad for your skin um <laughs> You know, I think a lot of times people who I I, I think kind of standard uh, laundry detergent isn't the best for people's skin. But if you're somebody's particularly susceptible to um, a lot of histamine release, then I think they're more likely to to react to detergents and chemicals. And generally, you want to limit that response because you know I think we see excess histamine as a, a kind of a a reason for a wide variety of skin issues. Um, and yeah, I mean, I would say uh, same goes with, you know, a lot of the irritating chemicals that actually are in shampoos in, um, in, in skin products like a sodium lauryl sulfate are extremely drying to the skin. And, you know, we think are, um, 
part of part of the problem. Um, but yeah, I would say it's a tough one because I think your reaction from an immune point of view really depends on your own immune system. And and one of the things that often I'm trying to do in practice is is help to balance that response. You know, so even natural things in the environment like tree pollen and certain plants can can cause massive reactions that can lead to can present with hives rosacea uh, other skin issues so it's a it's a tough one to kind of pinpoint a specific chemical but um but of course you know i i think um testing your skin's reactions to many uh, many irritants using like immunoglobulin tests um is a good thing to try and figure out what the trigger is um but you know all sorts of things like does it have oh, to be an immune reaction i'm not saying you're wrong i mean maybe it is or it is the majority of the time but can it also just be your body going this is toxic i don't like it because it's not like i get a rash or hives or anything like that i'm just like mm, you know like i just don't like it <laughs> could it yeah no no Fair enough. And I think, as you said, you know, like uh, industrial kind of bleaches and chemicals, benzenes, phthalates, none of that stuff is it's good. Um, and you could say, is it is it actually is it a physiological response of my immune system to, you know, to kind of alert that I've been exposed to something? I, I think so. Uh, but there are obviously degrees to of reaction, I think, based on someone's genetics and, and, and methylation and how they how they release and break down histamine. Yeah, and I do have a reaction to some stuff. I recently realised grass uh, bothers me, cut grass. So I do have that histamine response. I'm just saying I don't, I don't really get it to those chemicals. With those chemicals, I just kind of smell it, and I'm like, Ugh, I don't really want that. Um, it's more like a visceral reaction rather than allergy. Um, okay, so yeah, very interesting. Well, I'm sure we could talk about toxins for a lot longer, but let's go to the next one that you said, which is the hormones. Um, so what hormones are most important to balance for uh, skin health? And then, I mean, you could even skip ahead a bit if you want, and you could talk about what hormones you maybe use to help skin, um, or we could do that afterwards. It's up to you. Yeah, well, I'd say all of them are very important, but um, definitely um, DHEA, um, thyroid hormone, estrogen, all of these are um, essential for, um, you know, for keeping your skin you know, elastic and hydrated and, uh, and in good shape. And so, you know, often so, we, so we, sorry, yep. let's go through one at a time. So thyroid mm -hmm. I'm heard of, we talk about a lot on this channel, at least the dry skin, energy for every cell in your body. Everyone listening who knows my work at all is probably not going to be surprised by that one. But DHEA is interesting. I think that deserves more explanation. And also estrogen. I know a lot of people who listen to this channel are not a fan of estrogen. They, Some of them even think it's bad. The, the less, the better. I don't actually subscribe to that. I have to address that before. But could you talk a bit more about those two, DHEA and estrogen, and how they're positive for skin? Sure. So um, so, so DHEA um, is a hormone released by your adrenal glands, and we see it as sort of the hormone that kind of counteracts the negative effects of, of cortisol and the stress hormone that, that actually does promote skin breakdown, muscle breakdown, um, you know, and, and so we're, you know, we're kind of seeing it as it's helping to undo that damage that um, stress and other, you know, other factors cause, um, you know, the, the damage that, that, that the adrenal glands endure because of those environmental factors. Um, and DHEA, just like the other, uh, well, just like the sex hormones, de de decreases sort of after the age of 35. And, um, and so, and often I see uh, people who are on hormone replacement, you know, they will have estrogen, progesterone, but no one, no one's checked their DHEA. And that's, you know, almost zero. And uh, I do see that correlate not just to, to dry aging skin, but also um, low energy, lack of vitality. And you know, I think you could take that further and say that the people who really are struggling in their day to day um, are unlikely to be then doing the kind of the, the activities of daily living that would contribute to a healthy skin and well-being so if they're that tired they're not really going to be thinking so much about their hydration status what they're eating and um and so i often see the dha as a bit of like a rescue hormone that if we can get that level up um and actually give dha often people feel a bit better and then they're more willing to take on these these you know lifestyle um techniques and changes in what they're eating to help Mm, that's interesting. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and what about the demon estrogen? <laughs> Tell us about the benefits of estrogen. <laughs> yeah, I think. I mean, I think estrogen's gotten such a bad rep compared to 
progesterone, but also when, um, and DHEA. I think DHEA is now kind of the, people are considering it like the youth hormone. And, uh, uh, but e estrogen is, um, I would say, just as much of, you know, we think that women, women age, you know, in after the menopause, because of that lack of estrogen, like bones get weaker, brain gets less sharp and skin um, gets more wrinkled um, because of um, a, a lack of estrogen. And that includes, so there are three different types of estrogens, but specifically estriol, which is the um, the least estrogenic estrogen, but one that is very important for um, the health of the mucosal surfaces. So that does include skin, includes also gut lining, um, uh, vaginal wool. So like women who, for example, have dryness down below that, that's a very important uh, estrogen that's usually lacking. Um, so it's important to really get all three of those checked. Um, uh, but then estradiol as well is very important for uh, the health of um, the health of the skin. And I normally, I, I do use it for, um, I mean, not necessarily just for aging, um, aging skin, but I like to use a combination of estradiol and estriol um, to help, yeah, to help support women in that period. I think the book Estrogen Dominance uh, is one of the reasons why estrogen is thought of as purely bad. And, you know, a lot of people who watch this are followers of Ray Pete, who also talked about, you know, there are a lot of studies about the negative impacts of certainly excess estrogen. Um, so my understanding is uh, you want like the input, the ratio to have a good level of progesterone to estrogen in the case of women and testosterone to estrogen in the case of men is important. Uh, but still, if you completely lower estrogen, that's not good either. Uh, is that your understanding too? Is that, does that sum it up or is it more? Exactly. And I mean, I, I would say that, um, in, yeah, in, in women who've had problems with estrogen dominance when they're younger, then inevitably when those levels fall, you're going to get much lower levels of progesterone and, you know, and, and DHEA relative to estrogen. And so I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't prescribe estrogen uh, with those hormones, if that estrogen level looked like it was actually normal in, in, within a normal range, whereas those others were almost zero, um, and so now I think I do agree with what what you're saying that you have to take into account. Like, has that person struggled with estrogen before, um, or with excess estrogen? And if that's the case, then you really wouldn't prescribe estrogen unless you've worked on those detoxification pathways on the gut, because there's there's so many things that affect you know, why somebody's estrogen dominant, um, you know, for a majority of, 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 uh, women, it's, it's actually bacterial overgrowth and gut issues that cause them to, um, that basically, uh, prevents them from being able to excrete estrogens from the body. The estrogens recirculate. Um, so that needs to be addressed before adding in any estrogen. And I think that's why HRT is sort of not done in the correct way. And, um, by, many members of the medical community because they just don't really see that those upstream effects yes uh, resolve this one for me because uh i've seen conflicting views on this i know you're up to date on a lot of the latest research um my understanding still is that estrogen is what is responsible for a lot of feminine traits so when same with testosterone in boys during puberty estrogen goes high in girls during puberty and that leads to a lot of the the, the female physiological traits um, but I've seen some people say that, no, that estrogen is not true. Estrogen isn't the female hormone. It's actually progesterone. And I was like, I don't think this, I don't think these people really understand the physiology properly. Um, like I remember listening to biological, uh, sorry, biochemical, bioidentical hormone doctors talking about how they could uh, even help, you know, uh, women have more feminine facial features, for instance, by using different types of, you know, balancing different types of estrogen and stuff like that. Like it has a huge impact on your appearance, even down to facial features. Um, so what's your take on this? Again, as someone who's aware of the latest research, like is estrogen a hormone that leads to feminine traits and that increases feminine traits uh, during puberty and beyond? Or is it, you know, is it, is it not, or is it a combination of things? What's, what's the deal? I mean, in my, my understanding, uh, Yes. I mean, I'm, when I think of it as a, I guess I'm thinking of it as a negative thing, for example, in males where often you have feminine features in those with, um, uh, you know, quite a lot of adipose tissue and you're getting peripheral conversion of testosterone and estrogen. And that usually does correlate with, um, I would say like a smoother 
face and almost a more feminine looking face. And you will sometimes actually see that in, um, I would say, uh, obese males where, uh, you know, they're, they're, if you actually look at their face, it looks it, it looks quite younger. I mean, some people could say it could be the the adipose and the fat, but I think the the estrogen levels play a big role there as well. Um, for for women, I mean, I haven't I haven't really heard it put put in that way, but certainly I see an an imbalance where, for example, women who are struggling with uh, polycystic ovaries, where they have relatively high levels of testosterone relative to estrogen, progesterone. Uh, you know, we see non-feminine features like excess facial hair, um, acne that's often in the distribution you tend to see in males with excess testosterone. And uh, by sorting out that balance, which can include, you know, having the estrogen levels go up whilst the testosterone goes down, um, uh, will lead to, I mean, when I, when you say feminine features, I mean, I, I, I've, can you mean sort of like more kind of smooth, supple skin or uh, or do you mean more like angling of the face, those sorts of things? No, I think it's more the the uh, lat, uh, the former, what you said. I remember seeing one study where uh, I think men and women were showing pictures of women during the part of the cycle where the estrogen is the highest and estrogen was the lowest. And consistently, both men and women judged that the women where the estrogen was the highest was more attractive. And this is purely based on facial features. So it does something to the face. And it's probably what you're saying makes the skin more subtle. I think it uh, made it glow a little bit or something like that, like a little bit more of a flush. I'm not quite sure. I can't remember. But yeah, those kind of things. That's really interesting. I'll, ha I'll have to look into it a bit more because I have, um, I mean, I will say that there is now a, a trend of using um, estrogen on the face and actually progesterone topically. And uh, there's a bit of a debate, like the conventional medical community say that there's not really much evidence that it helps. But um, in my practice, I have seen that um, actually topical estrogen in particular, um, particular um, topical estriol can really also help with fine lines and women have reported sort of smoother, um, more hydrated skin. Um, you know, but that's one where, you know, ideally it should be one that's prescribed because I think the sort of danger with that is that some of the the topical estrogens that people are buying kind of on the internet might not actually have the percentage that, that the bottle claims. So, uh, so, you know, I think you, but of those ones where we've used sort of a compounded pharmacy and they've, we've been using topical estrogens on the face, it does seem to have a good, uh, a good effect. Yeah, we were talking about this before. I, I mentioned to you I'd seen a picture of someone who claimed that using topical progesterone and there was a before and after photo and it, the skin seemed to have literally de-aged by about 20 years from like 50 to 30 and you said that you had seen cases of that being the case with, sorry, topical progesterone. And progesterone is probably safer to use than estrogen. Um, I know all hormones have some danger, but overall I would think it would be safer for someone to use. Um have you seen any case of that where progesterone deages the skin, like used topically? Uh, both. I mean, I'd say I've seen quite dramatic effects, but they were in women who uh, had extremely low levels, and you could see that you know they that they were just completely depleted in hormones in general. So we saw not only just, and I would say I, would, I used a combination both specifically on the face, but then also um, different doses and different concentrations for systemic hormone replacement. Mm. It's interesting because when you think of uh, skin and hormones, the only one that's um, uh, prescribed commonly is cortisol, right? Which, as you said, is, is actually catabolic and <laughs> going to break down the skin. And yet, that's the main that's the main topical hormone that's actually prescribed on a regular basis by doctors, right? Well, yes, this is a big issue. Actually, one of the reasons why I actually started to have a, a bigger interest in, in in skin and skin care because. Uh, that is really the only thing you see being prescribed are topical steroids. And, and of course it helps to, um, you know, it can, it can very much help with, uh, inflamed skin and, and, and as a temporary measure, something that does soothe the skin, but ultimately it's actually leading to a weakening of the skin barrier and, and that issue just recurring. So you, you know, you, that's where I guess kind of use doing a skin program a bit more holistically, you know, we were kind of aiming on how do we 
prevent you from having to go back on the steroids. So looking at the health of the skin lining, the gut microbiome, other things. Uh, but it's a it's a big problem because I think steroid withdrawal is uh, is is just terrible. The skin looks a lot worse than it even than it used to, and it just you know leads to the circle of more steroids, weaker skin, uh, more breaks in the skin, infection, and it's just something that I really like to stop. And I found um, traditional Chinese medicine to actually be very effective for helping with, um, uh, helping kind of get people off of topical steroids. Okay. Uh, do you mean herbs or ac acupuncture or something else? Uh, more herbs, actually. I'd say both a combination of herbs that you're taking orally, um, but also some topical formulations that use herbs that don't use steroids um, that can really help with it, clear, like doing it in that, those three stages, like clearing heat from the skin, um, then working on uh, tonifying the skin and working on those organs where there's an imbalance. And um, yeah, we've, and I've, I've seen some very uh, very severe cases of both eczema and psoriasis resolve and actually people being sort of not reliant on steroids for years so um definitely it's possible one thing i don't understand is i know cortisol has a strongly anti-inflammatory effect but doesn't progesterone also have a similar effect like why is progesterone not used for that purpose more commonly i realize not it won't work in every case but why is it never thought of for that purpose i think you know in um yeah, I think when dermatologists are sort of treating the skin, it's like the, for them, it's just this mindset that it's either something inflammatory that's irritating the skin or it's something bacterial. So they're just really only thinking <laughs> antibacterial, antifungal or or steroids. And they're not really, I think, thinking about the effects of the other hormones. And I think it just kind of goes back to medical care being quite disjointed because, you know, I would say that conventional uh, gynecologists and doctors who are prescribing hormones aren't necessarily thinking about the skin. They're thinking more about hot flushes and disrupted sleeping and using using those hormones. So it would be, yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, but no, you're right. I mean, progesterone theoretically should have a good effect from, from that regard. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's weird, isn't it? Okay, so uh, lifestyle factors, that would be the next step which is in a way the broadest category we've already talked some of them like light exposure sun exposure um i mean i know there's the uh, phrase beauty sleep so uh is that myth or is it true more sleep equals less accelerated aging of the skin uh, definitely and actually it's it's interesting because people often say that uh their skin um uh, ages rapidly after they have children and I've always thought that that was kind of correlated more to the the sleep disturbance particularly when they have younger children um it's been my my theory but definitely I think that's probably the biggest uh lifestyle factor that um that contributes um even more so than you know nutrition and hydration uh I think that you you know you do so much of your um restoring and um and the, the tissues tend to restore when your body's at rest so the less of that you have the less recovery time your skin your skin has um you know and we're definitely seeing a bit of an epidemic of that that makes perfect sense well we talked about how blue light is probably bad like in excess you know at night and all that what about a uh, red light uh, I mean, that's an environmental factor. Uh, you know, we get it from sunlight, we can get it from open fires, stuff like that. We can get it from red light technology these days. What's your view on a red light and the skin? I think um, I think there's really good evidence to support red light. And um, I've, um, I recommend it to most of my patients. Um, I mean, I, I recommend having one of those desk lights. I actually I have one right here next to my desk. Um, that's um, oh right, okay. You, um, I've never seen one in a cage that... before. Are you worried about escaping? Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Is that um, to stop you burning yourself no, accidentally? I think yeah, exactly yeah. to stop you burning <laughs> yourself. Uh, okay, because I think when 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 you start telling people about red light and these devices, I often get this like shock factor, like oh, I can't spend like thousands on like a red light unit and having you know kind of this chamber. And it's like no, you can just even get a desk one, and they're not that expensive. But I find for both the skin and the eyes, it's um it's a good thing, and I try to. Because you know, I see work a lot on my computer, so I try to 
you know, take little mini breaks and just have the red light on my eyes and face. And uh, um, I think it's a really good adjunct to uh, to neutralize the blue light. Excellent. And there is uh, evidence about, you know, it helps with collagen synthesis and speeds up the detox enzymes that help to um, clear away the toxins building up and all that kind of stuff, right? So it has numerous benefits from skin and health from what I've seen. Exactly. And I think it's, um, you know, as you said, there, you know, perhaps like way back before we had all of this technology, people were getting actually a bit more red light exposure from from fires and other sources. And because I think one of the one of the kind of debates I usually have about people with skin health and um, on skin health is, oh, you know, we'll look at back in the day, like, you know, my my grandmother, who I think had quite good skin, she she didn't you know, she didn't have any of these devices, but then, you know, she probably did, she didn't spend as much time on the computer for sure. Um, and also I, I would say that her, her, her diet was probably pretty high in like fats. We should probably go back to that actually, because I was going to say that there, um, I have seen pretty good results with using, um, using actually lard on the skin and beef tallow. Um, and, you know, we think that is actually also a rich source of a uh, certain fat soluble antioxidants um vitamin z and i know that in eastern europe that was a big part of people's diets and and you know it was first maligned that, that that's the worst possible fat you can have but now they're you know people are changing their mind a bit about these sorts of um fats in the diet and i think there is some some evidence to support and i can certainly see like just in you know skin quality and um and as a moisturizer like going back to kind of simple things it's actually a, a very good non-toxic one to put on the skin yeah it's the only thing i do i said i do coconut oil i just don't like the smell of beef tallow on my skin that's the only reason but you know it's that saturated fat i think coconut oil is kind of slightly different benefits right it has the mct oil and the caprylic acid and uh salicylates and you know some other potential benefits but uh but either way yeah i think putting oil in your skin would be the one thing that i would recommend everyone does even if they're like me and otherwise doesn't bother doing anything for their skin i think i agree it's like a very basic thing to do but yeah, more to the kind of the modern, the new age, I think the red light is a, is a good adjunct that I would recommend. And actually then also on sleep and skin um, and fabric, uh, you know, there's, this is more anecdotal, but I, I have seen that um, like sleeping, for example, on like silk um, pillowcases is not as abrasive to the skin as certain um, other pillowcases. And, um, you know, I've, I've at least anecdotally heard from my patients that they they do feel like that they are they notice differences in like the amount of fine lines if they're sleeping on silk compared to um to regular cotton. I think the the um other people use more synthetics things like satin um but I would just say then I'm not sure if that's really going to be so good with the skin breathing and that being a more synthetic fabric but that's another thing to just think of when you're sleeping that could have an impact on your skin yeah let's say even a real pure silk pillowcase is not very expensive maybe a whole duvet set would be but the pillowcase is yeah exactly you good. can just have the pillowcase and then, <laughs> and that's good. and likewise actually even the um if you think about skin and skin abrasion like the type of towel you're using makes um makes a big difference so uh ones that are generally uh, softer and and actually even just how you're how you're handling the skin is quite important you don't really want to be rubbing it but you want to be sort of tapping it when you're when you're kind of washing your face I mean all of these things take should be taken into account when you know with, with skin that makes perfect sense uh, in terms of lifestyle stuff I was just thinking like probably the number one thing that I would do for skin health actually would be uh, sweating I just feel like opening the pores and letting all the Toxins or as much as possible that's like there's a kind of a lot of lymph channels underneath the skin, right? So like clearing all those out regularly so that it doesn't get overloaded and blocked and, and start to cause skin irritation. If I were to think of one thing that I do put effort into re very regularly that maybe is helping my skin health, that's probably it. It's probably sauna. These days, actually, I do hot baths because I do like bath bombs with uh, sodium bicarb and um, citric acid to create uh, some carbon dioxide, which is also good for the skin, I understand. I'll get your take on that. So yeah, but let's start with a simpler version first. Sweating. What's your take on sweating? Good for the skin? 
Definitely. I should have said, was going to say that's often why um, a lot of people who don't do very much uh, for their skin, but they exercise, uh, don't have um, a lot of problems, I think, uh, and especially people who are able to sweat, because you have the opposite problem as well with toxins that some people just can't break a sweat. And and that often does correlate to poor poor skin health. And so one of the things that, that I'm trying to work on is inducing that sweat. Uh, but I would say, um, yeah, I think that exercise has so many other benefits, but just the fact that it is stimulating the sweat and you are eliminating toxins through there will have a good effect on on, on skin health. Um, this is where kind of the, the, the sunscreen conundrum comes in because, um, you know, I, I, I sort of do advocate that you're protecting the face. So at least if you're not going to have enough sunscreen on the, the face but you, you want to induce sweating you should at least be wearing a hat and then using kind of a non-toxic type of sunscreen on the face um you know so you know when I'm exercising I I pretty much have just like a white pretty much a white mask on my face and then a hat um but then you know even though you are you will still have some sweating of the face there as well that helps with with overall skin health but then sweating everywhere else of course okay yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what about, uh, I don't know if it fits into lifestyle, but I don't know where else it would fit into, like, clay. Um, clay is something I do not do regularly, but uh, I found it very, very effective for inflammation, even quite deep. Um, when I had, uh, had uh, what's it called, dry socket uh, a while ago with my tooth, like, it's one of those things where nothing helps with the pain. You probably uh, come across it. And I found just putting clay on the area, even though it's on the outside of the skin, it, it still was so effective at sucking out the inflammation, or I guess heat, you would say in Chinese medicine, that uh, it would reduce the pain for a while. It, it was actually miraculous how effective clay is for pulling out inflammation. I have a few other anecdotes I won't go into about how incredibly effective it is. So I, as I said, I've never really bothered with the skin, but I, I'm trying to think like if I had inflammation in my skin and I wanted to deal with it, probably clay would be one of the first things that I would personally think of. So what's your uh, opinion and experience with that? Definitely, I would say both um, topical and actually in some cases oral, like things like oral gypsum things, um, are extremely um, heat clearing and uh, I do recommend those types of um, like clay masks and, and and things on the skin normally I combine it with some other um, Chinese herbs that are heat clearing as well uh, but I you know I usually recommend um, there's some like sorry just clarify mixed in with the mm -hmm. clay like it's a mixture like herbs and clay yeah huh, never yeah heard of that. and then kind of put as like put on as a facial mask um i i've used that i mean i um because i i did some skin training in korea last year and they used these um gypsum and clay mud masks particularly for um you know uh, any condition where we thought there was a lot of heat in the skin and uh but it was it was one where you'd have to kind of regularly come in once a week for let's say you know six times but when I, when they were at least showing the case studies it had a really significant effect even for i would say quite severe cases of acne um, and um, but again it was not just the clay mask it was the whole regimen of making sure the skin is properly cleaned exfoliated um, like gently exfoliated um, mask red light and then um and then a good sort of oil um and hydrating agent after that because a lot of people find clay to be quite drying to the skin so you then have to just make sure you're moisturizing it with the right uh, right ingredient yeah that makes sense okay now you mentioned earlier how the traditional dermatologist is pretty much only going to see it as either inflammation or an infection and you know step six in my system is infection you know especially chronic infection it's, i guess it's usually a chronic infection that would cause a long-standing skin issue so uh, tell us about that a lot of this lifestyle stuff may not be enough if there's an infection at the root of it right exactly and i mean even i'd say deeper down like an yeah an infection in let's say the gut or you know, SIBO or, um, you know, not just let's say that your skin is blocked and you have an, a localized infection, but, you know, I think that, that, uh, I always start with the gut in, in skincare and that's where, um, you know, if somebody has having a lot of digestive symptoms and they have skin issues, then we, we first work to, uh, to clear any excess bacteria, any excess candida or parasites. And even just by doing that, we often see, um, we see, uh, 
major improvements in the skin. And interestingly, a lot of the herbs that are used as antimicrobials are heat clearing herbs from the Chinese medicine sense. So it actually kind of fits fits together. Hmm. Yeah, so we talked a bit about Chinese medicine. Uh, actually, no, before I get to that, sorry. Um, yeah, let's talk about infections a little bit. Okay, so gut infection. Is it ever a skin infection? Is it ever, uh, you know, like uh, eczema, psoriasis? Uh, I think psoriasis usually isn't. I'm trying to think. What kind of skin issue is an infection from your uh, experience? Is there anything? Yeah, I mean, for example, now we even in conventional dermatology, we there's been a um, there have been there's been research to support that a certain type of mite um, is actually responsible for rosacea. So, for example, things like ivermectin, like topical ivermectin, are actually quite effective in treating that. So that's being used in the in the conventional um, uh, community. Uh, but yes, I mean, you do have. Um, uh, you do have like seborrheic dermatitis caused by a fungal infection. Um, you have, uh, and by all means, you can have localized, you can have a gut infection, but you can also have like localized blocked comedones and, and, um, and, you know, pimples that are coming up that actually are because of that you know, those, those bacteria that sometimes aren't even so problematic, but they, it's the combination of the bacteria and the dead skin cell and the oil that then causes, uh, causes the, um, uh, yeah, the, the growth. And, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so to answer your question, you can have a, an infection of the skin causing the skin issue. And what about fungal infection? Is it only cause really obvious stuff like ringworm or can it be a fungal infection behind something like a rash or something like a bit more nondescript? Yes, so fungal rashes usually look a little bit different. They they're, um, they often have like a circular appearance or they tend to be only on one side. Um, and, you know, all sorts of, um, you know, there, there are many types of fungal infections. I think tinea and ring, ringworm is sort of the most, the one that most people think of. But, uh, you know, um, seborrheic dermatitis, where you have kind of that oily scaling on the skin or on the scalp is, is thought to be fungal as well. Um, you know, and that's where actually working on the gut microbiome, where your good bacteria are supposed to help you fight off fungal infections is that's why, you know, that's why it's important to address that to treat the fungal infection as well. Mm. Okay. And uh, just before we get to solutions, uh, you know, the last tip in my system may not be relevant to this, but uh, like emotional or psychological issues, do you see a correlation there? Do you ever work on that level or is it not so relevant for skin issues? I, I definitely see, um, you know, for example, um, people who do have intense histamine responses and present with rosacea or rashes, we know that emotional factors can can lead to that uh, release of histamine. So, uh, you know, I always, I always address it. I mean, it's because I guess I'm, I'm usually not seeing somebody um, just for the skin health, there are other other factors. So typically, there'll be some element of adrenal dysfunction there as well. So I often there try to address you know, is your body in this like fight or flight response? How are you handling stress? And, um, and, you know, I think we, can, we certainly see uh, differences in like, let's say the degree of rosacea, the degree of like a, of a histamine response by working on calming down that nervous system. Um, I would say kind of the therapies that are more psychological, I usually have to refer out for, but it's, you know, I at least try and broach the subject that if there is an unresolved issue and, uh, or you think you're really struggling with how you're handling your day to day and you need um, a psychologist or, you know, like an emotional freedom technique a practitioner or any, any kind of support like that, that it could have an effect on, on the skin. And because I think we, you know, we live in a society where, you know, the first image you usually see of somebody is their face. Um, you know, they, if, if people see that their, um, their skin is looking better, often they see that their mood is also, um, better and they feel a little bit more able to kind of take on the, the day-to-day -day stresses of the world, as we can say. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I figured it probably wasn't your number one go-to thing. I don't think it usually is, but I was thinking about, the person who I met who had the worst skin issues, and I'm going to try not to say anything identifying here, but uh, they had really tough, dry, like woodish kind of skin, and it was unbearably itchy. 
Um, and I know it got so bad that it, it would make them want to, you know, like give up on life. Um, it was so unpleasant. But I know that it started after they went through an extremely traumatic experience. And I know that extreme emotion would come up for them with this sensation of itchiness. And, and it was a very real skin issue. And I did wonder if there were was like a trauma ultimately, you know, behind it. And so I know that's an extreme case, but I was wondering how often that may be the case. Because again, because the skin is such a surface thing that everyone sees. So I wonder if, you know, sub, like it is your subconscious trying to, uh, you know, communicate something uh, something in a very obvious way. I don't know. It just uh, I was wondering how common it is. Um. No, I definitely, I mean, this is, I definitely um, have, have heard, um, you know, for example, you know, people saying that um, part of their like long COVID syndrome was actually an extreme aging and an extreme change in skin texture or hair texture. And um, I mean, that would not really be an emotional factor, but just other, you know, an insult that can cause such an extreme reaction. And, um, you know, certainly I think your, your, that that fight or flight response that that sort of leads to increased cortisol is going to effectively lead to skin breakdown because it's you know the way that you, it leads to muscle breakdown and the, the effects of cortisol so i think absolutely it makes makes it makes sense um but i think you know one of the things that even in kind of conventional gp land we were always taught was were just about the psychological effects of of um skin disorders and how you know it was upwards of three fourths of people who had psoriasis were suffering from depression um you know and 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 just to not kind of you know to because i think we we think of it as you know maybe this superficial thing that oh you know i'm because my skin doesn't look good, I, I I'm not happy, and that's in a way me being a bit superficial. But you know, it's I think we can all think of um, you know, people in our when we were younger who had bad acne, and most of adults who then have gotten past that always kind of remember that period of being a, a traumatic period for them, and it's you know, so I think it's you know we shouldn't sort of like diminish the magnitude of how much effect it has on people's mental well being. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so that makes sense. Well, we've already covered quite a few, I guess, suggestions for improvement while discussing the, you know, the the seven areas of root causes. So let's get into now. Um, let's start with skin aging, and then we'll go into more of the problems of the skin, the specific problems with the skin. So, do you want to tell us maybe some of the thing, like your go to things to help skin aging that we haven't covered yet? I know you said TCM kind of techniques is one of them. Maybe you want to start with that one. Yeah, I mean, I would say to be fair, TCM I I, I use a little bit more for problematic skin, so maybe like, okay, for okay, more kind of psoriasis well, them up. But or the Korean yeah. system was that uh, more anti aging? You were saying. Yeah, I would say that the Korean system. I think um, starting with even just the simple things. I mean, women in uh, in Korea often would just you know would go on their lunch break or once a week just to have their skin properly cleaned and that's why you have just um you have um, these services everywhere because it's just such an important part of their culture uh, and it made me realize i mean like compared to my my own regimen where you know i wasn't so invested in it particularly what i was what i was using uh, or i wasn't i didn't have kind of a detailed regimen it re really made me think twice about oh okay am i actually getting rid of that dead skin layer that is um you know that that is being generated all the time and i was like oh i don't, I don't think i am um, and so you know it's just about making sure that you're cleaning the skin properly and um especially if you are wearing spf um or or any makeup um and then having some sort of a light um a light peel often the um things that are used in peels can be from fruit acids so there are or lactic acid like not not very overtly harsh chemicals um and you know generally their their approach was sort of you know uh, light things that can help more frequently rather than sort of extreme procedures that uh that you know that could cause kind of more harm than good um you know so i'd say that basic routine is kind of the first um the first key to kind of prevent prevent aging and i would say from a from a topical point of view um i mean i do recommend things like um 
retinols, uh, so vitamin A derivatives, and um, and certain plant extracts. For example, a lot of antioxidants um, like uh, um, xantho, um, xanthohumol, so from the hops plant, is a very um, potent antioxidant. Um, vitamin C on the skin. Um, so I like to have sort of at least um, some sort of antioxidant that women are using topically. Uh, and then, of course, of um, yeah. Sorry, in terms of topical stuff, I know a lot of people, again, watching are uh, fans of peptides. Uh, do you like the uh, GHK, uh, GHK copper peptide? Yes, I love the GHK copper peptide. I, I mean, that is one that I suggest all women use if they do have any, if they do any sort of procedures like microneedling or radiofrequency microneedling. I always, that's kind of my go-to for, um, for uh, like post-procedure to kind of put, to heal that kind of um, uh, that recovery process uh, but it, I find that's a very good one to actually put underneath sunscreen um, and I use a like two to three percent GHK copper peptide on every day um, and it's uh, it's quite an interesting it's, it's it, for you for those who haven't seen it it's a very very nice color blue <laughs> and um, it's one that I think is uh, you know it's it's actually been around more than people think. It's become quite popular recently, but uh, um, it's definitely one that, particularly for that like dry, uh, scaly skin, it's it's good. But I mean, even in those who don't have dry skin, um, like I don't have dry skin, but I find that it's just a really nice, um, a nice thing that soaks in very well and has quite good uh, good research for its anti aging properties. Mm, interesting. And the other peptides that you go to, I, I can imagine like something like BPC-157 or TP-500 would be beneficial, but maybe you wouldn't use them because they're expensive and the effects would be minimal. So uh, yeah, what, what what peptides are worth the money from your point of view? Are there any others? I, I mean, I would say BP, BPC-157 just for the mucosal surface. I like Mot C as well because of from you know mitochondrial perspective and 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 kind of helping with that, those would probably be my kind of my my go to skin peptides. But I mean I I think the GH GHK copper one is my sort of my favorite one for skin specifically. Um, I you know I would say again it really depends on um you know if somebody's skin let's say has aged um because of you know, after a viral infection, then using things like thymocins um, or, you know, would be, would be something I would include. Um, but I don't, um, yeah, I would say that probably the copper is the only one's consistent one that I use all the time, um, just specifically for skin aging. Um, uh, but, you know, the peptide world is kind of, it, is uh, advancing every day and um you know there's certain also like bioregulators and things that i think are good but i just at the moment just don't know enough about them to recommend them because it's um i would say though there is actually um this could be relevant because i think we're we're talking about skin from a um maybe more aesthetic sense but uh there's a very interesting product um called uh curaderm uh that is um I believe it's actually derived from from aubergine eggplant um that is has very strong antioxidant effects and um it's actually one that um is uh, has been used even on um you know certain like like bccs and and, and skin cancers um but also just for um you know for any kind of growths on the skin so there are many many other agents that are that are good other peptides um yeah i was gonna say just because the copper one seems to always dominate the, the my head yeah. space uh, that's okay let me ask let me ask you another question um what about i was thinking back to nutrients actually what about niacin we had someone on a while ago who was a skin expert and their main focus was on niacin you know their claim was that the skin is always depleted of niacin to various degrees so they were a big fan of uh, topical niacin uh, what's your take on uh, topical and niacin in general it's an interesting one because niacin kind of taken orally we often associate with skin flushing so we just you know see would um want to then pick like a uh, flush free niacin uh, but i think you know your skin does need oxygenation and we know that niacin is so important for vasodilation so um 
I personally haven't think, really. Sorry, just to explain that, I think their perspective is uh, like it was a lack of NAD plus that was the issue, and so the niacin would boost the NAD plus. That's that's where they were coming from. Fair enough. No, it makes a lot of sense. But I, I mean, I would I would also look at it. I mean. To be honest, niacin derivatives, niacinamide are in lots of skincare products. I think it is actually even in one of the creams I use. I probably do use it, but it's not usually something that I've used in isolation. But I, I think that, um, you know, I always talk about with mitochondrial health, um, how important oxygen is. And I think just oxygen and perfusion, and I think anything that would help would theoretically help the skin health. So that might be another angle to look at it, not just the from strictly a cellular mitochondrial angle, um, you know, but I was going to just add that uh, apart from, from niacin, um, I really like to use things like um, methylene blue and H2 tablets just to increase oxygen status. So if somebody has, let's say, aging skin, but also suffering from muscle cramps and exercise intolerance, then that might be uh, another thing I would use. And I've seen that actually really um, improve like color to the skin. And you know, it makes sense because you're then perfusing the skin more. Yeah, okay. Electron donor in the case of uh, methylene blue. How much methylene blue would you use for uh, skin health? What kind of range? I mean, I'm like I say, some 20 and 40 drops. In, but I that is, if I convert that, that would be somewhere around... Um, I mean, that's I a imagine. lot. I think that's 10 to, 10 to 20 milligrams. I think it's usually yeah, half a milligram then, a drop. Yeah, I think maybe I'm I'm overdoing it, but just no, please note that with my patients, a lot of them are really struggling with mitochondrial issues. I would probably start with, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe kind of like a, a third of that, um, you know, but I think... With meth and with methylene blue, to be fair, I normally start with like five drops and then increase by five each week. Um, but I would say most of my patients who've really found benefits in oxygenation and then perfusion end up going to, you know, 20 to 40 drops a day. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. Have they noticed any issues stopping? And there's a whole community of people claim you have like a really bad withdrawal when you stop with methylene blue. Have you experienced that? To be honest, I probably haven't pushed stopping it so much because uh, people just have been feeling quite quite good with it. And you know, in my experience, if you, you know, I've heard that it's it's something that if you're really overdoing it, you're actually going to see a buildup of some blue like under the fingernails. And I've I've never seen that. Um, but I can imagine, I can imagine if you're just taking the methylene blue and then you're not really using that increased ATP and oxygenation to do more physical exercise and, and, you know, you're not kind of haven't really worked on it from a kind of a root cause perspective and stopping is probably going to lead to you just going back to where you were. Um, but it's been, it's a bit more of the issue that people feel worse after stopping yeah. it than they originally felt. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apparently. Uh, it's okay. If you, yeah, if you haven't come across that, I was just curious. Um, skin tightening. Um, when I think of skin tightening, you know, uh, I'm thinking of two things. First of all, if ever I put aloe vera on, which I do sometimes, it really seems to tighten my skin. I don't know if that has any permanent effect at all. I'm just curious. And then, you know, I met a person who 
did uh, facelifts, facelifts uh, using purely acupuncture, they claimed. And they worked on all kinds of famous people and made loads of money. And allegedly it was very effective. I never tried it. Um, I just wondered, as you, again, you're quite familiar with that Eastern world as well, if you'd come across that and if it's something that you would recommend. Or if there's anything else you'd recommend to tighten the skin. With the aloe vera, I, I mean, I often recommend people use also, if they're not allergic, but egg whites and aloe vera. Uh, I mean, the effect's often a bit temporary with the egg whites, but like, for example, you know, let's say as a kind of a pre-event regimen, if you're preparing your skin, that often really does help to kind of to tighten the skin temporarily and give you a bit of a better appearance. Um, yeah, I would say with skin tightening, I'm more of a fan of... Um, of machines or acupuncture. Um, I know that, uh, you know, facial acupuncture has a long history. The only sort of downside of that is some people who bruise very easily often get bruising with facial acupuncture and then they're not so happy with, uh, you know, their skin might look tighter, but they have all these bruises. So they, they kind of, for them, just, they don't think it's worthwhile. Um, but I mean, I think, I think to be honest, it's like the facial acupuncture is basically um, where you know, where now we're using microneedling and radio frequency microneedling, that's all kind of stemmed from that idea that the needles are increasing collagen production. And, you know, I think um, I would definitely recommend facial acupuncture. I don't use it in my practice, um, but it's one where I think if you wanted to do it, you should be doing it a bit more regularly. Like you can't really go for one, one session and, uh, and, 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 you know, there's just not going to be enough to then really like stimulate the the collagen synthesis. I have found though that, yeah, like um, either just yeah microneedling or the radio frequency microneedling has had great effects on on skin tightening, um, and this is you know again where in I would say in 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 Asia and in Korea um, their their frequency isn't quite as strong, and I find that it ends up being better because if you do break the skin in the process of doing one of these procedures, you're more at risk of micro, um, of a hyperpigmentation. So I quite like that less is more approach where you're doing sort of lighter micro needling. Um, and I found that, um, yeah, you know, in my patients, it's really helped, um, uh, things, you know, like for example, skin laxity in like the double chin area, uh, around the eyes. Um, and it's, you know, there's not really any, um, I think if you do a lighter version as well, the downtime isn't as um, as bad. I mean, usually you're a little bit red the day of, but then the next day, your skin is is pretty much um, back to how it how how it was. And then usually the effects you see uh, later, so you see them about a month later because it is trying to stimulate that that collagen production. Um, yeah, and then just going back to what we said earlier, but. Uh, the it's important after those procedures to have antioxidants added in so i like to then use the ghk copper but also uh you know some of the things like vitamin c and other antioxidants on the skin okay yeah that makes sense is there any other procedures that you are a fan of you know weighing everything up like the cost the potential side effects you know uh, the the hassle whatever <laughs> like what what's good value to you uh, you mentioned microneedling. Is there anything else? Um, I would say, I mean, going back to kind of also non non invasive things, um, I, and I find a lot of the facial massage techniques that are used in um, well in Japan they have a like kabido facial massage, um, and then in in Korea they have this. Um, it's quite actually it's a painful massage but it's a it's one where they're really trying to change the bone structure it's called a golki massage um and i i find um that one isn't particularly relaxing i tried it once but i find that you know people who like i think a lot of times people just have so much tension in their face and that's also causing a big degree of aging and so if you're doing anything that can help just relieve the muscle tension there um uh, you know i think that that's that's one where it's it's good for your skin but it's also good for your mental health um and those tend not to be so expensive those sort of facial massages but ideally you would be doing that you know like at least once once every month every two months you know not just as a one-off um i mean i would say 
most most bang for your buck probably would be it, it's expensive but something like radio frequency microneedling you can do that and even after one session you can see um yeah, i would say good good results uh the, the, the problem with that is it has to, you really have to have good aftercare and you have to make sure that the um aesthetician or the doctor you go to doesn't doesn't try to I would say it doesn't try to overdo it with the machine because if your skin is quite sensitive, you can actually leave with a bruise and sort of bloody face that uh, that then does does heal. But it, you know the blood can the, those spots can actually lead to hyperpigmentation, and then you might you might end up regretting it. But a well done one, I think, is probably the best bang for your buck. Okay, um, but there's no art yeah. to it. Yeah, there's um I, I guess one other one other um uh procedure um that i really like to use it's not really a procedure but the a frequency specific microcurrent um where you are using frequencies um i haven't i've used it more i use fsm in my practice more for for pain for fatigue um but uh you know on all the courses i've been on there have been um you know there are programs for skin health skin laxity acne anti-aging and um i mean i know in, in, in at least when i've seen the case studies they looked quite convincing but it's just it hasn't been something i've done in my practice so much but i think it's something to look into for um for skin health and that's actually something that if you have an fsm machine at home you could theoretically run it the time uh, at night okay uh is that crazy expensive to buy for someone Frequency specific microcurrent machines are pretty expensive. I mean, normally if you go and have a session done, it's usually around a hundred pounds. Um, you know, depending on the area you're in. Um, you know, but uh the machines usually are, you know, upwards of like a thousand pounds. But I wouldn't probably invest in it specifically just for skin health. But if you are somebody who happens to have one for other reasons, then uh, and you have a practitioner who let's say programs it for you, then you know, you can add a program on for skin health and that's a fairly low, it's a, it's a very low risk um, thing to just have um, to, to help also with collagen production and tissue repair. Nice. Okay. Well, let's get to the specific skin issues. Um, I know probably we've really, and that's why I structured it this way, because I figured a lot of the advice we've given probably will be helpful for all these things already. So we can just limit ourselves here to, you know, the things that are specifically for each issue. And I, I probably will forget some of them, but off the top of my head, uh, let's start with psoriasis, maybe. So when I think of psoriasis, I think of uh, sunlight and vitamin D as being one of the f like first things I would start with. But again, I'm no expert on this. What's What's your take on psoriasis? Psoriasis. So I think this is where, um, you know, looking at these conditions holistically, it's it's quite a, you know, you have to look at all areas. And you know, psoriasis we know is an autoimmune condition. So uh, vitamin D is definitely a big component. But I would say the health of the gut lining, um, and you know, and also seeing if that psoriasis has been after a viral infection, after a traumatic event, and really, you know, trying to work out what's caused it. Um, there are many different types of psoriasis. So like the most severe type, like erythrodermic psoriasis, that requires, uh, I would say, quite an extensive program to really go really deep, as you're saying, because you have to then look at the surface, you know, and, and the kind of the deeper organs. Um, but that in my practice, I would say, you know, something like low dose naltrexone has actually been quite effective for helping, um, helping with psoriasis and then you know, topicals that are like heat clearing, um, reducing dampness, um, looking also at, um, you know, uh, omega three to six, um, balance, but vitamin D that's where actually I found some of my psoriasis patients have to be on, you know, 10,000 units of vitamin D a day. Uh, but we 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 get to that dose because we know that their levels are very low, and then when we we recheck, their levels are you know, normal on that dose. Um, you know, so you do, yeah, I wouldn't suggest that you just go and take that high amount without knowing what your level is. Yeah, yeah, very wise. Yeah, okay. Um, and let's go to we talked about acne next. I know that's not it's kind of associated with teenagehood, but of course, some, I've met people who have it in their forties and beyond. So. Uh, what's that about? What's the best thing for that? 
Um, so with acne, uh, I would say, depending on what, what the what the age is, obviously there's a hormonal link and the kind of hormonal fluctuation that, that contributes, but often that hormonal fluctuation is because of gut microbiome imbalances, I find at least in, 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 in teenagers. Um, so that's often where you know, we're doing a lot of SIBO clearing and, and repopulating the gut with good probiotics. And, you know, there are um, specific lactobacillus strains that are supposed to be particularly good for skin health. Uh, I haven't found that necessarily you need to find a probiotic that is for skin health. I found that, you know, that we kind of look to see what you're low in on a gut microbiome test and then, um, and then, it, and then really kind of work from there in terms of replacing and uh, repopulating the gut microbiome um yeah and um so that's usually where i start but i would say for um particularly for adults with acne um there is often still a link with hormonal imbalance and particularly women for example who are having a lot of acne in sort of the chin area um so that's where i often see things like uh, polycystic ovaries and then we're really trying to work on T like reducing testosterone and um and also um yeah balancing balancing that out mm, okay uh what about uh eczema is there anything distinct about how you treat eczema eczema again autoimmune and i would say that um the eczema patients i see in my clinic i see a lot of children um with with eczema and there we often see a big genetic component with methylation and um and you know often you'll see that eczema hay fever asthma it's all in the, the one child and so you're working at that on that systemically um i think you know food allergies are a big thing that i see and when i say food allergies often it's again that immune system the gut lining issues it's not it's not for example something that you eliminate this one food and the eczema is gone forever. It's often that you you can, you know, do an elimination diet and then work on the gut microbiome health. And I've seen quite a few cases of eczema cleared simply by just doing that. Um, I've also in adults had some cases where, you know, they had lifelong eczema. They didn't really tell me very much about it. They had come to me for other issues, but, you know, looking at um, toxic metals and actually clearing the metals and using binders really seemed to just completely clear their eczema. Yeah. So that's yeah, another component. Interesting, because I know, again, we have various schools of thought I know who are common commonly viewers of this. I know one of them doesn't believe in autoimmunity. They just think it's it's really toxicity, you know, like um, if the immune system is reacting to something, like that wouldn't happen if there weren't some kind of toxic excess, excess going on there, um, which I don't agree with completely because I see genetic tendencies for elevated immune reactions to things. Uh, but I think it might be more true than the mainstream acknowledges that toxins are like a significant factor with that autoimmunity. It's a tough one, yeah, because I, I mean, I guess you could also argue uh, if we're all being exposed to toxins, let's say in the same family, then why is someone, you know, why is there that often I'll see a parent say, well, this child had the eczema, the, the, the hay fever and the asthma, the other child didn't. So I think, you know, in that case, you would expect the exposure to be quite similar. But I do agree that I think toxins do contribute, but then mycotoxins could be contributing microplastics uh, and you know that we have to sort of just figure out what is the culprit and then kind of work work from there yeah yeah i think that makes sense uh okay other skin issues dermatitis i mean that really just means inflammation of the skin right so we have already talked about that is there anything distinct about dermatitis just that um like seborrheic dermatitis is often fungal and so it's it's kind of, it's, it's it's good to sort of just differentiate between the the two but uh i mean i definitely see that being linked to to also toxic exposure and um and general um the yeah, like irritation of the skin so that i i think more of toxins when i think of dermatitis uh, for that reason interesting any other i've forgotten any kind of common skin issues that you treat regularly that i've forgotten I mean, I would say it it kind of goes with the eczema, but hives and just someone who has rashes that that I, is generally almost always a histamine IgE problem, and then really kind of correlating that to, um, you know, which which also could be toxic metal driven because when we think of something like MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome, 
you know, my answer is not, okay, we just give an antihistamine and move on. We really are still trying to figure out what, what's causing that his, that histamine overload and release. Um, you know, it could be genetic, but then also could just be continual uh, toxin exposure. Um, other skin issues? I mean, I, I maybe sort of um, outside the scope, but vitiligo is something that I see in my practice. I think I had um, that mildly a couple of years ago. I noticed that in photos. So tell me about that. I mean, we also think that is more uh, autoimmune. And um, uh, yeah, I'd say I, looking at it from a Chinese medicine perspective, we've used other, other kind of forms of herbs that are... Uh, I'd say more kind of tonifying uh, rather than like heat clearing, uh, but then also low dose naltrexone I've found can be quite effective for for that. Yeah, interesting. Um, one of my business partners, again, he always says this stuff publicly, so I'm happy to say it. Um, he was going through his genetic reports and he saw he had a very high genetic tendency for vitiligo and he goes, oh, I don't have that. And his wife goes, yes, you do, remember? And she, like, she pointed it out and he's like, oh, yeah. So I think that, that can be one of those things that you don't even notice because unlike you know, eczema and all those things, it doesn't irritate you. Um, but of course, it can be very extreme and uh, you know, really impact your quality of life. But you can have a mild version without even noticing, right? And it's probably a good thing to notice because it's an early indicator of autoimmunity. And it turned out that he actually also had Hashimoto's, which is a much more serious and uh, potentially debilitating form of autoimmunity. So vitiligo is definitely not something you want to ignore, in my experience. I think that's that's also, um, you know, these conditions that are autoimmune in nature, like psoriasis, often, you know, you may have psoriasis, but that can progress to psoriatic arthritis and more like systemic conditions. And, and I, I say, you know, if somebody even has a childhood um has had bad eczema as a child, they're more uh, predisposed to another autoimmune condition. So it's just, I think then having that mindset that my immune system is maybe slightly more reactive than the average person's. And I just need to be careful about, um, you know, making sure that my gut is in order, my sleep is in order. It's just a kind of another, you know, another factor. And, um, you know, I think often people sort of say, well, <laughs> why am I so unlucky? Why I have that? But I always kind of compare it to, for example, um, you know, some people who maybe struggled with their weight when they were younger, often they then actually, you know, get um some some, you know, important lifestyle practice on board early on and then you know, then get healthy and then don't suffer some of the, you know, the consequences of like accelerated aging inflammation because they may have had a challenge earlier in their life uh, so it's not necessarily a bad thing just something that you know you just be aware of and, and then kind of plan how you live your life accordingly the one other skin thing i just thought of uh is like skin tags moles like warts any of those kind of things my i guess more localized skin issues um how would you approach those you know to be honest i i found that the in the U.S. versus the U.K., the the um uh, the way that it's approached is completely different. Yeah, in the U.K. <laughs> it's completely ignored, right? <laughs> Let me just yeah. say, yeah. <laughs> um, whereas I think it, like in the U.S. is just okay. Well, if you have any sort of a growth that theoretically could be irregular, you might as well just get it off your skin because there's just no point in it being there. It's not really serving a purpose. Um, I know that you know people who have quite a lot of um. um moles or nevi uh we think that there might be an issue with liver and liver detoxification but i think there's just also a big genetic uh predisposition there and um you know i would uh, i mean it's a very important topic actually because you know skin cancer is um the most common skin cancer in the world is um, the, the non-melanoma type though but still you know it is a, it is a cancer and i think that is um Again, something that if there's a big history in the family, I would just be making sure that you're, well, monitoring those moles, maybe even, um, uh, you know, being signed up to a program where those, those um, you basically get a bit of a, a scan that then you get, you know, you just compare your moles year to year. Uh, but I'm pretty much a fan of just getting rid of them if, if they're changing or, you know, just, I just don't think it's worth the risk. Maybe I'll come and see you for that. I got like a half dozen that I've had for decades that, you know, like I've got one in my armpit that occasionally I like catch on something and it hurts me. I'm like, oh, maybe I should do something about that. Um, one thing that I was just thinking as well 
I know we said we might do hair in this episode, but we're way beyond that. We, we've got to wrap up very soon. But uh, just thinking maybe we could just touch upon uh, nails when we talk about skin. And um, uh, I was thinking of like a fungal infection on the nail. That's quite a common thing because then it spreads to the skin often from the nail, right? So can we touch upon that? Like what would we do about that? What's the best uh, treatment for that? Sure. Yeah, I was going to say hair is like a big topic. Yeah, so we we'll cover that another time. Instead, could talk about, um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, um, nails that I definitely see correlated uh, like weak and brittle nails to more mineral deficiencies, particularly zinc, biotin, um, lack of protein, low depleted adrenals. So I, you know, I would say that. Um, uh, it would be looking at like your micronutrient status and and that also can have a genetic predisposition so it's worth kind of looking at any genetic report you have just to see uh, do my snips related to zinc or vitamin a or uh, you know or um or my skin elasticity how do those look um but yeah i think generally the, the nails are quite interesting because i think if they're breaking easily you know that there's just something deficient there um with, with regards to nail infections that's actually, it's a very tricky area because I find that, for example, like toenail, uh, fungal toenail infections are very difficult to treat. And I mean, I'm convinced that it's, it, it really is a perfusion issue that people who often have um, those, those toenail infections uh, may have like numbness in their feet, varicose veins, like signs that the circulation is blocked. So, um, you know, so I, I've tried, apart from, you know, using antifungals and also just making sure that somebody doesn't have um, candida or, you know, a lot of fungal overgrowth in their stomach, I've also just tried to use things like methylene blue and... Um, Topically and or H2 orally? And things. Uh, orally, orally, just to improve the, uh, to improve oxygenation. Um, but it's, it's, it's a real tough one. It's one that I would say that has been very difficult to crack in some of my patients who've had long-term toenail infections. Um, but I think it is worth, um, you know, I think it's, it's just worth making sure it's not related also to things like metabolic issues. So if you are somebody that has a, a toenail inf infection that won't go away, I would just make sure that you've had your blood sugar checked and it's not diabetes, you know, or something more serious and that, you know, you, and then if, if it looks like things are more or less okay, you try, you know, you can try, of course, um, like more, I'd say non-toxic antifungals help with perfusion, um, try to keep that area as dry as possible, uh, those sorts of things. But yeah, I wouldn't try and preoccupy preoccupy your time with it i would just make sure that it's not the sign of something else more serious mm. uh, thyroid might be another thing right if your thyroid is uh underactive then you it's much harder to get rid of these chronic infections and vitamin d like you said i've known people who claim that their total fungus went away when they up their vitamin d levels so yeah there's various things we've already discussed which could you know make the difference no, exactly. Uh, and I was going to say, I think if your thyroid's sluggish, it can just lead to issues in every bit of your body, nails, to toenails. So uh, that's definitely one where... From the tip uh, of your head to the, the tip of your nails, like, and all the way in between, right? It's, it affects everything, the thyroid. Yeah, I, I talk about this a lot on other people's podcasts as well. <laughs> and I think I think that the issue is there when we say, like, what nutrients are good for the skin? Or it's like, well, if you have a thyroid issue, then actually you're probably going to have to look at your iodine status and... Um, and other nutrients that you maybe wouldn't necessarily correlate with the skin, but if if the if the predominant root cause is actually a thyroid disorder, then then you do want to look into those sort of nutrients. Yeah. So let's finish with that sentiment then. Like, if you do all the stuff that's recommended in this episode, or a lot of it, and you're not getting anywhere, then you really need to see a professional and work out what underlying issues you know might need to be addressed of, of various types that we've talked about. I won't review them all again. Um, and so, uh, an excellent person to come and see. 
especially if you're in the UK or Europe, uh, where she is licensed as a medical doctor and can prescribe and all the rest of it, or throughout the whole world, because she does consulting and she also travels, as you've seen. You seem to be constantly traveling between different European countries, Dr. Miriam, every time I talk to you. And I know you regularly go to the US and all that as well um, for different purposes. And and, uh, you've traveled to Asia in the last few years and all the rest of it. So you're an international um, woman of mystery. No, uh, (laughs) international doctor. Um, So yes, wherever you are in the world, if she can't work with you directly, then she can refer you to someone who's more local to you. So I definitely recommend uh, checking out Dr. Miriam. If you go to uh, Dr. Miriam Mikitsky, um, which I won't try and spell, but we'll make sure that we have the link for that. Uh, Maybe you want to spell it out, actually, Dr. Miriam, but we'll make sure we also have the link in the show notes. Uh, Yes. um, Well, thank you so much for for having me. And I was just going to add on to your point, like what you said before, it's very important because your skin is, you know, if something is wrong there, generally it's, you know, it could be a manifestation of something else. So I just wouldn't ignore it. And, uh, you know, if we go back to what the first time we had our podcast about blood tests, like it's just really good to just make sure that everything is okay, especially if you haven't had any kind of a blood test for years, Um, you know, especially with things like, for example, diabetes. Um, So just not to ignore these things. Um, uh, But then, yes, to your other point, um, yeah, I have quite a a interest in skin conditions. So I would obviously be happy to try and help anybody. And uh, um, if you, if you go to my, my website, Dr. Dr www.mikitsky, so my surname, M-I-K-I-C-K-I, medical.com, um, there's an option to have an exploratory call. So if, um, if there's anything I can help you with, I would be happy to have a have a stab at it. Fantastic. Free call, no obligation. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Miriam. It's been fascinating as always. I've uh, learned some very interesting tidbits and uh, I'll stop going around claiming I don't know about skin health because I now have learned a bit. I can say I know a bit. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, if you're watching, remember, uh, like, subscribe to the channel, leave comments underneath. Um, if there are any comments to Dr. Miriam, because I see her fairly regularly, I'll probably be able to corner her. In fact, there's one comment underneath a previous video I'm going to ask her about as soon as we start recording. So any questions, go ahead and uh, put them in the comments section on YouTube. Remember to like, subscribe. Remember to share with anyone that you think would be uh, that open to it and it will help them. If you know anyone with skin issues, please do share this episode with them. And otherwise, see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment, and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.